I'm Leandra Letterman. And I'm Allison Christians, and welcome to the finale of season one of Break Into Tax. Today, we're very pleased to have with us Professor Jonathan Choi from the University of Minnesota Law School, who will unlock his paper, Beyond Purposivism and Tax Law. So John, the three of us are at a conference together and we're about to head into the elevator, maybe to go to the reception. And we'd love to hear about your paper. Give us your pitch. Well, most tax scholars are purposivists. So they believe that tax statutes should be interpreted based on their purposes rather than their literal text. I argue that purposivism is useful, but it's incomplete. Because tax statutes are so old and tax cases are so complicated, a lot of interpretive questions have no clear answer based on statutory purpose. So we need a more explicitly normative theory to answer those questions. So John, the conference we're at is in Minneapolis and the reception is actually on the 40th floor. So we have a little more time for you to talk further about your paper. Is there more that you can unlock for us? Well, actually, a lot of the impetus for purposivism in tax law comes from commentary on tax shelters, because shelters exploit the literal language of the tax code to reach results that Congress didn't anticipate. Now, this is true, but I argue that you can't divide abusive tax shelters from legitimate tax structures based on how Congress thought the statute would apply. Because the tax code is so sprawling and so complicated, there are always legitimate tax structures that Congress couldn't foresee. Take, for example, the double dummy merger, sometimes known as the top hat merger. This is a merger that's tax free, but not because it qualifies under the reorganization provision of the code, section 368. Instead, it qualifies under a section of the tax code prototypically used for the formation of new corporations, section 351. Now, Congress probably didn't anticipate that section 351 would be used in this way. But double dummy mergers have been used for billions and billions of dollars of transactions, and there's no question that they're an acceptable tax strategy. That's not because of statutory purpose, but because normatively there's no reason to distinguish between this kind of merger and the ones that fit cleanly under Section 368. So the difference between a double dummy merger and a tax shelter isn't that statutory purpose supports one and not the other, it's that tax experts like us support one and not the other. So we've arrived at the 40th floor. We're at the reception. Not many people are here yet, so we have time for a couple of questions. Well, I have a question. As you were going through your paper, you're talking about the connection between the text and the purpose, and you're inviting us to go beyond purposivism. So where are we going in this great beyond? Well. In the paper, I've proposed two answers. So for an agency like the IRS, a way to go beyond would be to just make pragmatic policy judgments. What is the best policy answer? What is the best rule for a particular situation? And I think the IRS has that authority under Chevron deference. If the statute is ambiguous based on its purpose, it has the authority to write what it thinks is the best rule. For courts, I think they already have an answer in the form of common law anti-abuse doctrines like the economic substance doctrine that can give guidance when statutory purpose runs out. John, you mentioned earlier that we could use pragmatic judgments to inform the meaning of a tax statute. What are the boundaries of that? It's an interesting question because a lot of the criticism of purposivism from say the new textualists is that it just allows judges to engage in judicial policy making. And so in this case, I argue that the IRS should engage in that kind of policy making, and there aren't really any boundaries to that. And that's just something that I think we have to live with. If we're going to be engaging in this policy making anyway, we might as well be upfront about what we're doing. Some people like to call their work in progress their baby. So thanks so much for sharing your baby with us, John. Thank you for having me today. This was really fun. Well, on that note, thank you so much for unlocking your paper for us, John. This is a great way to end season one of Break Into Tax. Stay tuned for season two of Break Into Tax. And in the meantime, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss any content from Break Into Tax.